First things first, uh, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I have a family, I have a life. Uh, this is a very long book. You don't have to read the notes. The end notes. Oh, I didn't skip. have to read the whole No, that's oh, fine. son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what an incredibly uh, thorough documentation of the causes of the immigration crisis, uh, the discussions that have been going on through multiple administrations. Uh, in your mind, what has us trapped in this sort of Sisyphusian nightmare? Yeah. I mean, for years and years, we've watched kind of in this loop as politicians in Washington say, we can't pass comprehensive immigration reform because of the situation at the border. And yet, the situation at the border is in a state of chaos because we have not passed comprehensive immigration reform. And as a result, the asylum system at the southern border has borne the brunt of the otherwise failing system. And so we're stuck in this loop where lawmakers in Washington point to the border to justify their inaction, and the border is in the state of chaos that it is because of inaction in Washington. Right. I almost never hear politicians talking about how many people can you absorb? I mean, when you tell me there's going to be two million people coming through the southern border and they are just, you know, being kind of logged and, and released, that sounds utterly chaotic and a recipe for disaster. But how many people can this country uh, absorb? What do we need for economic growth? What is a better system? I feel like we never talk about that. We just react to images of, of chaos. Absolutely. I mean, we can't talk about one aspect of the immigration system without view of the other. And so, you know, if we're only ever talking about the southern border, we're missing the right. entire kind of picture that we need to better understand. But just as an example, you know, right now, uh, the and you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, the, no, the I chairman. Do. Of the, <laughs> you're, you should. You should don't. You're the only one. Until you read the footnotes. I, um, you know, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, you know, economists across the country, everyone is pointing to the fact that, you know, immigrant labor has essentially kept this country's economy afloat following the COVID years. Uh, and so, you know, this is the engine of growth. The population now, is getting older. That, the that immigrant is labor can be uh, more easily exploited, uh, is paid less, starts to depress wages for a lot of other people. Is that not accurate? I, I, I don't. I don't think it is entirely. Uh, I think it's a so much it's murkier somewhat picture. Somewhat accurate. <laughs> uh, Reasonably accurate. Well, until until there are ways of absorbing an immigrant labor force legally into the country, right. there are always going to be opportunities for employers to exploit the undocumented and, in the process, to drive down working wages. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea is there needs to be a thoroughgoing reform of the system. And the problem is, of course, that in Washington. That's been dead on arrival now for decades. And so we're kind of in this doom loop where the border is the symbol of everything. Uh, but obviously, in a kind of commonsensical way, the only way to approach this broader problem is to deal with every aspect of the system. This is where you drop us like a little drop of sunshine and you say, but here's the good news. Yeah. Go. Go. <laughs> What's in here? No! <laughs> um, I would say the good news is that from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. at least doing some of the things to relieve pressure at the southern border are no great mystery to lawmakers. I mean, the problem, of course, is the politics, but it doesn't require any great feat of the imagination. This is not a complexity beyond the imagination of, of human beings. <laughs> Correct. And we don't have to restabilize areas we destabilized to really get a handle on it. It's about fixing the system of of influx. I mean, I think, you know, overall, the only way to kind of deal with migration trends in the world is to understand the forces in a global context. And that means that the United States has to be more mindful of the consequences of its foreign policy. It has to work with, with partners in the region, you know, all very I'm realistic sorry, things. I'm sorry, I blacked out yeah. when you said, <laughs> you said something about mindful foreign policy and yeah, exactly. I just started thinking about you two in the sphere. I don't know what's going on now. Um, but I will say this, you know, one of the way, you know, reforming the asylum system specifically is a complex task. And I, and I do think some hard decisions have to be made about kind of reckoning with the population of people showing up at the southern border right. and kind of understanding what the limits are of the asylum system as we know it. But before we get to a point of having to make these major sacrifices to, to a system that I think really should be a core part of American policy for sure. ethical reasons and just for straight ahead policy reasons. Branding, for, for God's <laughs> brand, To say nothing else. Um, there are things that could be done, basic things like sending more money to the government to hire more asylum officers, more immigration judges. These things sound boring. They sound wonky. And, and very specifically, Republicans in Congress are trying to block these very straight-ahead basic 
measures from taking place, just basic funding measures, because they benefit from increased chaos at the southern border. Right. And so there are things that could be done that so would not, the not election, a silver bullet. You have, there's no hope until after the election to, to even address any of it. I mean, it's pretty overwhelming to see right now Republicans in Congress basically say, we're not going to touch this. I mean, they've said it explicitly. This well, isn't saying my interpretation. This is the greatest danger to America, you know, maybe ever, and we're not going to do anything because we think it's a great issue. I mean, that's truly devious. Yeah, and, well, and the plot of that playing out was the administration, the Biden administration, went to Congress and said, we need more money to increase resources right. at the southern border. And but they were slow on the uptick as well. Absolutely, and, yeah. and there's plenty that the Biden administration could be faulted for. They go to Congress, they ask for money. That doesn't work because Republicans say, no, 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 we want to see further changes to the asylum system as we know it. The administration goes to the negotiating table, makes a series of compromises that Democrats were not comfortable making years ago. I mean, pretty significant changes just in their own orientation in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And they finally broker this deal. I mean, this isn't just a Democratic effort. This is a bipartisan group in the Senate doing this. Yeah. Before the terms of the deal are even announced, you have Mitch McConnell saying to his Senate members, listen, you know, the politics of this, I think the phrase he used as it was reported, was the politics have changed. And the politics having changed were Trump came out against this negotiation. Wow. And, and so it was very clear, I mean, a very clear calculation was made yeah. that we benefit from this situation getting worse. It's so tough because, you know, McConnell's usually so idealistic. It's just hard to see. I was shocked. It's, I was shocked. it's shocking to think, <laughs> geez, self-serving politics. That's not the guy I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who is gone is here. It's available. Jonathan Blitzer.